All right, what's up everybody? This is Ryan here, and you're watching, I think, episode 86 of my live stream Q&A. So, uh, a couple of announcements, but before I proceed, uh, I've had a really, really busy weekend uh, prepping to launch an application, so if I look like exhausted and uh, am not particularly coherent today, then uh, that's the reason for it, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll still uh, try to answer questions as best I can. Um, but yeah, uh, so a couple different announcements. So this month, or the, yeah, it's uh, one, this is the uh, final day of the month, but uh, in June, I basically focused on refactoring and preparing an older application of mine for re-release. Uh, I did have it released for about two years, but uh, it eventually, uh, two things happened. So one, number one, it got pulled from the Play Store uh, for uh, because I was too lazy to update the uh, content ratings. I, I didn't break any rules per se, but I just neglected to do that. And secondly, when I first released the application, it contained a bunch of information essentially. It was Half of it was basically like an alarm manager app, and the other half of it was like a, an application for instructing people on how to improve their posture, uh, hence the name Post Trainer. So uh, not long after I published the application, I, uh, due to having poor posture uh, and lifting heavy weights, which is not a good combination uh, for my young friends out there, don't don't do that. Um, I figured that I probably was not an authority on teaching people how to fix their posture. So several years later, uh, after two years of quite extensive rehab work, after tearing multiple back muscles and really being uh, um, quite uh, broken for a while, I'm happy to say that uh, I'm back to lifting uh, I'm as strong as I used to be, and now I have better posture. It's obviously not perfect, because one of the things about having good posture is that if you're a programmer or a desk jockey, you spend all your time sitting or at a desk or doing whatever, you're never really going to have perfect posture. You're, you're going to have to try and fix it every day. Anyways, this isn't, isn't an infomercial about the... Uh, application, but I've decided to republish the application with new informational content, and uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, the application is functioning. I'm just doing like final bug testing and uh, pretty much prepping for release. Anyways, uh, what? so something which might actually concern you, the viewer here, because I, I don't, obviously you're not here to just listen to me uh, give an informational uh, session on an application I'll be publishing, but I have just uh, recently, um, uh, I'm just about to, I, I'm literally, let's, let's do this in real time, I'm going to actually publish the code open source. So you can have a look at how I, well, my latest iteration of uh, building applications. So I'm just going to run a Gradle build here so it could lag for a minute. Naturally. So once it's done building... It should throw an error. I just tried to push it to... Uh, where was that error? I just tried to push it to version control and it wasn't letting me do that, so we'll see. Commit and push. So yeah, I'll uh, publish the code open source pretty much uh, as I'm doing right here. And uh, what I plan to do today, depending on how many questions I'll get, is I'll kind of just start rambling about the application, different challenges, different technologies, and different approaches I used. And hopefully as I'm doing that, people can ask different questions um, about different things. So uh, let me just double check. It's 
I'm trying to push this thing and it's just saying that there's an error somewhere, so I want to fix that before I push it. Where is the error? Ah, here we go. Ah, I see what was going on. Okay, so we'll just get rid of that. And I should be able to push to the repository now. Oh, that's a fun question. Uh, what's up? Uh, I, I'm not too sure. I'm just going to call you double A. Um, okay, here we go. All right, I'm just pushing the repository now, and yes, commit and push, and that should be uh, viewable for everyone. So push, and there we go. And GitHub Desktop is opening up. I don't know why I still have that program. I don't even like using it. All right, just give me one moment. I will get to your question here. Just going to make sure everything pushed properly. Okay, so um, so there should all. I think there's already a link in the description box below, but I'm just going to paste it in the comments. Here is the code, and uh, very happy to publish that thing. Looks like there's some errors in the repository because I deleted some screenshots, but that's okay. That's that's quite all right. Okay, so let's get to some. Questions and answers. So uh, we got a question from, let me zoom in a little, that would help. Here, I, I guess I'll paste your full name. I, I, I'm pretty sure this is a bit of a troll name, but we'll see. Maybe it isn't. There's a there's a bit of an, what's that called, an anagram in there? So the question is, reactive programming versus OO languages. So my first question, uh, double A, um, what do you think so so what is your experience level and I, I need to ask you what does reactive programming mean to you and it's perfectly okay if you're a complete beginner but if you are a complete beginner to what reactive programming means or if you're even not very sure of what object-oriented programming is please let me know right now because that will really change how I answer this question because uh, what I can do is I, I can I can compare and contrast these things, which is basically what you're asking me to do here. But uh, it took me a couple of years before I really understood what reactive programming meant in a way which uh, made sense, wasn't just like a scary buzzword. And uh, oh, I see you're from uh, Holland. So uh, yeah, goede uh, dag. About all the Dutch I know. Um, but yeah, uh, what is your kind of general skill level here before I get started answering this question? Because this it's quite important. Um, topics like this, we hear these names like reactive programming, and and it it can sound like really kind of scary and complicated. But w what I try to do when I teach these things is I, I try to to ground them in um, what I would call Simpler analogies, uh, that kind of thing. So I'm only going to wait like a minute longer, then I'm just going to assume your uh, skill level. But yeah, if you, could, if you could let me know. Oh, someone from... Okay, so you, okay, that's great. So... Uh, Double A says, for your hobbyists with Java and Kotlin. So I'm going to assume you've got the basics of object-oriented programming. Um, so reactive programming versus OO language. So um, I'm going to get into a couple of things here. So these things, so um, 
I would explain it like this. Um, I wouldn't actually really compare these two things. So if I were to, off the top of my head, give a definition of reactive programming, I would look at it like this. Um, writing, so uh, here, I'll try to be proper. Reactive programming. Writing programs in a way which accounts for multiple different uh, potential um, streams of events over time. So already I'm, I'm introducing some jargon, streams of events. So just one moment, I'm just going to pull up a graphic to make this a little bit easier to explain. And now I have to battle with Windows 10. So I just want to give everybody listening to this a, a general idea of what I think of <laughs> my idea of uh, reactive programming. So, um, and the answer I'm going to give here isn't dependent on a particular framework. I'm talking about just a general concept of writing programs in what I consider to be a reactive manner, which you can do with uh, Rx Java. You can do it with just threads. Uh, the observer pattern is incredibly useful. You can use coroutines is what I use now. Um, so when I think of reactive programs, what I basically think of is that, let's say, and we can do this in a functional program, we can do this in an object-oriented program, is the reason why I'm not going to so much compare the two. But since you're a Java developer or, and Kotlin developer, like I am primarily, um, I'm going to focus on a more object-oriented kind of approach to this idea of reactive programming. So basically what we do here is, let's just suppose we have some application and we're following some, let me hide my face for a minute, some architecture. So this on, I want you to think of these as like different layers of your architecture. So you've got like front end presentation stuff. So either it's model view presenter or model view view model or, or whatever, front end presentation stuff. And then we have some kind of, we don't necessarily need this middle domain layer. You can actually pretend this one doesn't exist if you're just used to having like Front end, back end, front end, back end. You, you can, if you're not sure about this thing, it doesn't matter. Uh, I I do have a domain layer in the application I was talking about earlier, which is domain, and that's kind of what I'm talking about. But a lot of people aren't familiar with that, so if that's confusing, just pretend it doesn't exist. And you'll notice this has some Rx Java jargon in here. So again, don't worry too much about that. So um, when I think of a reactive programming. A, sorry, a reactive program. I'm thinking of a program where it actually is designed to follow different potential events, different potential events which can occur at various stages throughout the end-to-end -end architecture or from object to object making calls to each other. So let's suppose, for example, the application let, let's, uh, I'll show you kind of a, let's do something kind of practical here. So I'm going to open up POS Trainer, and it's loading, and as you can see, it just loaded an alarm. So let's just, looking at this diagram, kind of visualize this. Okay, so I turn the application on, which starts in our kind of model view presenter stuff, and then a message is sent to the back end, get reminders or get some object, get data. So that message gets sent to the back end. Now, depending on what we're doing, how our application is structured, uh, maybe we have like two databases or we have like a local database and a uh, uh, REST API, or maybe we just have one of these things that I've generically called services in this thing. But the point here is we're making some call to the back end but we're aware of the fact that this call may either fail, so, so it might throw an error, it might throw an exception. Uh, if necessary, it might return nothing, so it's just an empty database, or it might return data. And then we can get into situations where 
we have to be concerned about calling several of these things and what the their collective bunches of events are. So when I think of this word reactive, it's that the program is actually inherently designed to react to all these different events, potential events. So what I tried to do there is give everyone like a way of thinking about reactive programming. That's not like some, oh, what does that mean? It, it's, okay, we're, we're actually designing our program to react to more than one event. So, and that's actually coded in there. Okay, so how do we actually do that? Well, the way I like to do that is with a number of different patterns. So let's, uh, I'll go through a couple of them. I know I'm not really comparing these things so much, but the reason why is that uh, I've written fairly reactive programs that are quite functional, and I've written reactive programs that are quite object-oriented. So I don't really, it's hard for me to compare and contrast these things because I, I think uh, reactive programming is in general it's, it's a way of writing programs, whereas object-oriented is, um, obviously it's also a way of writing programs, but like I said before, you can write a uh, reactive functional program, you can write a reactive object-oriented program. So, yeah. So how do we actually kind of achieve this? So reactive programming, writing programs in a way which accounts for multiple different potential streams of events over time. So we can do that in, we, we need a couple of different things to do that. So we need to be capable of repre, repre, can't type, representing different events uh, in a finite way. Okay, so what does that mean? So what, so to get really practical here, how do I actually model these different potential events? And then once they're modeled, react to them. What you will see in basically probably all of my projects since about 2017, I'm just going to open up Postrator here as one example. Um, I'm going to open up the back end. So actually, no, we'll go to our repository uh, interface. Okay, so here we have the interface to the back end. So this is the interface to this thing here, this part, facade repository. All of these functions return a result wrapper. And if I go to a result wrapper, This is a class, a sealed class in this case, which can, is capable of representing either success or error. So we have one object that can represent different states. So let's jump back to this diagram. This is what I'm talking about here. Different potential events. I could call this thing event wrapper even. In functional programming, this is called an either monad, which is to me a well, let's just say that name only makes sense to people who are uh, quite familiar with lambda calculus and nobody else. But yeah, so we need to be capable of representing different events in a finite way. If you are used to seeing Rx, if you're used to seeing, sorry, I'm trying to be a producer at the same time here. If you're used to working with Rx Java, you could kind of do this using. Um, on complete, or sorry, on next, uh, on complete, and on error. But even in Rx Java, I like to use a result wrapper. So this is the first step. So we need to be capable of representing the different events that can occur in our reactive architecture. And I would say, hmm, I'm, I'll have to be careful how certain I am about what I'm about to say here. So. I would say if you want to have an easy time with writing reactive applications, you should, I know my face is blocking that, just give me a moment. 
you should probably employ the observer pattern. So what does that mean? Um, that basically means to me, when you're building a reactive architecture, you want the different components in that architecture or the different layers or the different objects to be what we call loosely coupled. So what does loosely coupled mean? This, it's going to be tricky for me to explain this really quickly. But let's say I have an object and another object. <clears throat> that was a good voice crack. And they, they directly send messages to each other. So class A calls. Uh, so we have class A and class B. And A says um, B dot function. So when we're doing the observer pattern, in the observer, and this applies to RxJab as well, in the observer pattern, I, I shouldn't have focused in on the observer pattern because there's other ways to achieve this kind of a coupling. But in the observer pattern, each part of the app is considered to be either an event producer event producer or event consumer or I will say both which can be a little confusing. So again to go back to a visual diagram, the MVP, the model view presenter, the front end of your application, typically this will be an event consumer. This is where we check to see was the event successful? Uh, was it is it empty? Was was there an error? And then the back end is your event producer. And the reason why I'm, I, I shouldn't have really have focused in too much on the observer pattern, but that's just an easy way of um, building a reactive architecture. What I'm talking about here is that to me, in a reactive architecture, it, you should try to make it really decoupled from the different things. So instead of so much making direct calls to the different components, you want these calls to be probably asynchronous so indeterminate when they might return. Uh, and you want things to be quite loosely coupled. I, I'll have to move on because I'm failing to think of an easy way of explaining what loose coupling is, but ho ho hopefully you know what that is. So when we kind of put these two things together, so event, uh, basically representing the different things that can happen in our application in a finite way, so in Kotlin, uh, so Kotlin sealed classes are great for that. Um, then the other thing we can do, um, and actually let me jump to a quick front end example of, of this. So if I go to, let me just clear a whole bunch of stuff out here. So let's say for example I go to reminder list fragment. Um, you'll notice my fragments what they do is they basically just publish events to a logic class. Let me just uh, pull a couple things up here as an example. And reminder logic. So the way that I actually communicate to the logic class in this application, which is basically like a presenter from the view, is I publish events to it. So reminder list event on create but button click uh, on start. So this is a sealed class, which again, we're representing multiple different events, which can potentially occur at an indeterminate time. And then this comes into a function in this logic class called handle event. And then from the handle event, the logic class will dispatch to the appropriate function that needs to be called in the back end. So that was just kind of another example. So um, so to kind of tie this all together, hopefully, what, what I'm trying to explain here is to me what a, what a reactive architecture ultimately is, is we're in a, in a perfect world, we, we understand that um, our application does not work in a purely synchronous step-by-step -step manner. So we build the application such that the different layers or objects or components can communicate asynchronously at an indeterminate time. 
That's very easily done. I shouldn't say very easily. That's typically done using RxJava, or if you're in Kotlin, you can use coroutines. Uh, you can use threads. You, like, there's different options. Um, and then once you've represented all the different potential events and you you know how to react to them, then you have in what I would basically call a reactive architecture. So kind of those two things combined. So the different components can behave asynchronously. Uh, at, they can handle events which occur at indeterminate times and it doesn't crash. And the potential events uh, are represented in a finite way. So that's kind of how, that's like my, it's a tough thing to explain, but that's my 20 minute explanation of what reactive programming is. So I'll try to maybe riff on this a little bit. Reactive programming versus O language. So uh, I don't compare them. I build reactive based on my definition I gave you, mind you. I, uh, I basically build reactive uh, architectures in a primarily object-oriented language. Kotlin is, you can also use functional um, constructs in Kotlin. It's a multi-paradigm language. But uh, yeah, that's basically how I would do that. Um, or something similar. OK, so uh, I'm not sure if I actually managed to answer your question properly. Uh, my uh, Dutch friend, but uh, let me just check the comments and we'll see. Hey, what's up, A? Eh? Good to see you. So, uh, let's see here. Well, I'm going to kind of move on because I, I talked for like 20 minutes. It, it's funny, to me that felt like I was talking for 10 minutes, but then I looked down at the time and it's like, a half hour has gone by. So uh, that's what happens when you're uh, um, ADD. <laughs> okay. So, uh, um, so my friend whose name, unfortunately, I, I, I can't read, um, mentions that the uh, images on the GitHub README page of the Post Trainer project are broken. Yes, that is true. I removed them. Uh, I will fix that eventually. What's up, Gorilla Gaming? I'm doing good. Um, my friend Jamie, what's up, buddy? Uh, Jamie asks, uh, have I ever done any work with Apache Kafka? I have not, Jamie. I'm a huge fan of uh, building reactive style applications, though, because uh, to me that's really ultimately um, you you really want to if you can decouple your architecture powerfully and then represent every potential event stream, uh, then that's actually how you build a perfect program. Let me tangent for a little bit because I uh, handwritten. Oh, uh, sorry. I will. I'll try to answer. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I can give you a great answer here. Uh, Fadi uh, asks a question. Fadi Fourad, um, how can I make a handwritten? How can I make handwritten to do? I I think what you're asking. Uh, how to make handwritten notes in to do applications? So um, I've never worked with this, but let me Google really quickly. I feel like there's like a handwriting API. Um, text recognition API. Well, uh, Fadi, um, so I'm not 100% sure what you're asking. I think you're, you're asking make handwritten notes in to-do applications. Um, I think there's an API out there which can, um, I think what it does is it, it detects your, 
your handwriting and then it'll translate it into text. Uh, failing that, what you could do, which wouldn't be super efficient, because um, it would require working with a whole bunch of bitmaps, but you could basically um, make a bitmap out of whatever the user draws using some drawing API and then store that. So I don't have a great answer for you, and uh, the, I think the trick with it is um, if you want the user to just be able to like write whatever they want and store it like that, you'll have to store it as an image. And storing lots of images, especially dynamically created ones, it can be a little bit tricky. Because if you actually want to save them, you have to store them as uh, um, byte arrays and stuff like that. So it's a little tricky. Um, all right. Anyways, um, I wanted to add one more thing since we were on the topic of building reactive applications. So years ago when I was, uh, so I'm, I'm very lucky in that I have a really powerful uh, graphics processor in my brain. And this is where this image actually came from several years ago. But um, when I was learning Rx Java, but one of the things which I wanted to mention here, so some of you might be joining just now, but I just gave this very long explanation of reactive programming. And I emphasize that you need to be capable of representing each potential event in a finite way. But here's another cool thing. Once you do that, that is exactly how you write your unit tests based on those finite events. So as I said before, um, every so to take post trainer as an example here, um, if I open up a repository, let's do reminder. Yeah, reminder repository. Okay, so we have all these different potential events here. Actually, let me open up a use case. That, that'll be, yeah, let's do set reminder. So like I was talking about before, uh, to, to write in what I would call a reactive architecture means we're talking to multiple different asynchronous components at the same time, and each component can respond in a finite way, hopefully. Uh, in this use case here, set reminder and post trainer, in order to set a reminder, we I call this reminder API and tell it to set a reminder. So this calls the alarm manager and services. And if that event was successful, if, then we update the backend repository, the database. See how we're kind of doing that reactive stuff? We're reacting to the message here. OK, this one was successful, so go and do this. So you can use that. Like here, I have this unit test here. You can use those finite events and potential event streams to write your tests. So here I have a reminder set successful. And then I have reminder not set not successful. And what happens there is when the reminder API throws an exception, my way of reacting to that is I don't update the database. So I make sure that uh, this thing was not called the update to the database. So just a quick little tip there. Once you represent um, every potential event stream with a test, you have proven your program for the most part. Sometimes, you know, it's tough to prove things 100%. But uh, yeah, just an interesting little thing where reactive programming and testing actually go together like, uh, what's a good example? Apples and peanut butter. That's kind of a weird example, but yeah. So Fadid does confirm that's. Uh, handwriting notes. Um, unfortunately, Fadia, I've never uh, I've never done that myself and worked with the APIs, so I can't really give you a good answer there. Um, so I've got a question from AJ. Uh, 
Okay, why and how to modularize your app slash project. Okay, cool. Um, this is a great, very important question. Um, so here's, let's, let's start with uh, why. So here, here's the thing, AJ. Have you ever wondered what software architecture actually is and what it does for you? Because I'm going to blow everybody's minds here because I'm going to explain it in a way that is so simple that you should be able to understand it. Because believe me, when I was learning software architecture, I've been studying it for years, and early on it was such a pain to understand what the purpose of it was. Okay, so your question, let's, let me answer the first question. Uh, so why should you modularize your applications? It's actually the same reason. So, so I know some of you come from countries where you might not have paved sidewalks, but hopefully with the images you'll be able to see. Um, oh, well, that was a good voice crack. <laughs> okay. So here's a quick little story. Uh, because I'm probably on the autism spectrum, my brain is always asking questions like just everything about everything. I, like when I was a kid, I would wonder how I'm able to see through a mirror, or sorry, through a glass window, and yet it's a solid object and, and stuff like that. So one day I was, and this is related to your question, one day I was walking to work and at the time my job, I was a uh, suit salesman, a fine clothing salesman, true story. And I was walking along and I noticed that uh, some of the newer sidewalks in my city were uh, made of squares. Now, I grew up in a small town with not very high uh, property taxes. So I was used to seeing sidewalks which were just like continuous broken layers of asphalt. So to answer your first question, why, why should you modularize your application? It's actually literally as opposed to figuratively, literally and figuratively, the same reason why you don't build continuous sidewalks. What are those reasons? Supposing that a section was to become cracked or destroyed, one would only need to replace a single section to restore the sidewalk to its former shape and function, and one could build each segment of this sidewalk in isolation of the others. That's pretty much all you need to understand and that's basically what software architecture, the, the most important principle, separation of concerns, really is. The reason why, you, you, you ask, why would I modularize my application? Modularization is the process of pulling things apart into distinct individual pieces, as opposed to having one giant continuous blob. And it is the same reason why it's better to build a sidewalk in segments. Okay, so that's the first thing. I know that might make it sound simpler than it really is, but I really actually chose that analogy carefully. Okay, so that, that's the why. It's easier to, let's say this one segment breaks. Well, it's easier to replace. We just pull this segment out, put a new one in, and it's done. Also, you could hypothetically build these different segments of the sidewalk uh, in different places, in different um, different work sites or different uh, warehouses. So I really just uh, kind of think about that analogy. And if you're curious about this article, uh, uh, separation of concerns, is, it's basically my way of explaining the fundamentals of uh, building applications. Hopefully, I did actually uh, blow your mind there. So, and let's get to part two of the question. So how do we modularize your applications? Because now we're getting into something, uh, obviously um, building applications, modularizing applications is more difficult than modularizing a sidewalk. So that's where that analogy will no longer serve us. How? So um, you're gonna find a lot of answers to this question in that article I pasted. 
because um, we can actually look at modularization or which is basically just another word for separation of concerns. But we can apply this uh, to functions. So the way that we do that is you basically just don't write giant functions. Um, we can apply this to objects. So each object has one particular sort of overarching concern. Uh, we can apply this modularization to uh, the different features in our application. So package by feature. And we can even get into literally modularizing by creating different modules of our application. So let me kind of just summarize that. How? So number one. So uh, don't write giant, oops, don't write giant functions. Use helper functions. Don't write giant functions is the first step. So at the, at the perspective of code, the way that you modularize your application is you don't write giant functions. So what's an example? Um, let me show you a practical example here. And sometimes I bend this rule a little bit, but when I'm going through the different classes in POS Trainer, you will generally see that the functions are, I would say, between one to five um, lines long, typically speaking. And I make extensive use of helper functions. So when, and notice how this reads nicely. So uh, this function is called cancel alarm. So we talk to the back end, we say cancel reminder. And then if the result of that is success, call the alarm canceled helper function. Uh, if the alarm is an error, call the handle error function. So we're, we're basically, we're breaking down each kind of function into helper functions and kind of smaller functions. And that basically allows you to um, it's the same principle as the sidewalks, as always. If you have a giant blob and it's not working, it's difficult to understand how to fix it. If you have small little modules, a modular, modular functions, they're easy to fix because they're smaller, they're concise, and these helper functions help to improve the legibility of your application. Number two, uh, don't write God objects slash classes. So God classes, hopefully, I think every, I won't belabor this point too much. Hopefully everyone kind of understands this. And this is seriously why I think a huge majority of uh, educational material on Android is garbage, is that a lot of teachers will teach you to build like say 50 different ugly, crappy God activities demonstrating like 50 different APIs and they'll basically give you the impression that that's A, how you actually build applications uh, and B, that's really like the most important thing for you to understand as opposed to things like software architecture and, and the stuff that I usually focus on. So um, don't write God objects in classes. Uh, three. This is a uh, how I generally approach this. Try to treat each feature of your application as being a self-contained unit. So there's a couple different ways to do this. Uh, one of the simplest ways is uh, I'll go to the app module here. So each this is a combination of primarily what we're looking at here is what's known as package by feature. So we have the, the a list of reminders which is displayed and you will find everything that is necessary for that particular feature of the application even though it's a single activity application. Each feature will have everything it needs in order to function properly. So this is a, a process of modularization. So we don't have one activity with well, we do have one activity with 50 different screens, except that each screen is its own self-contained fragment with its own self-contained 
excuse me, build logic and and stuff like that. So uh, that's kind of at the level of packages and objects. And then finally, uh, number four. Um, build multi-module -mod applications. Now, here's the thing. For, for the juniors and intermediates listening to this, um, you don't necessarily need to build a multi-module application. Um, it's, it's an added level of headache and complexity which has benefits, but only in certain cases. So here's the thing. Um, if you want to share code between different platforms, you will want to build a, a multi-module app. So um, eventually I will have, so I was going to do an, an iOS front end in this application, but I think I'm actually just going to build a web and mobile, for, uh, sorry, a web and uh, iOS front end using React Native probably, we'll see. Um, for this application. Uh, I So that's one of the reasons why you'll see I have a, a domain module, a common module, an Android data model, and I tried to get this thing to say Android app, but I just, Android Studio was not letting me. But I will also have like a web app and uh, say a web data module. And those modules will depend on the domain and common module. So if you're building an application and you only plan to release it to Android, you don't really need to do that. You, you, I still suggest you sort of apply this kind of thing in your packages. So you should be following either package by feature or package by layer. Um, I do both, basically. Um, and then if you really want to take it to the next level, uh, and do some advanced stuff, then you can get into building like a multi-module application as I do. Um, but like I say, you only need to take that level of modularity if it's appropriate to the the task at hand. So anyways. Okay, let's see what other uh, things I can ramble about. Uh, well, since we're on the topic of multi-module, uh, so Eduardo, Eduardo asks, uh, do you know what's the point of Kotlin multi-platform? Is it made to create iOS 2? Yes. So, uh, cur oops, sorry, sorry. Um, currently, uh, Kotlin supports um, iOS via Kotlin native, and then we have web via Kotlin slash JS. So let me just find something here, Kotlin multi-platform. There was a there was a thing. There was a GitHub project. Um, where is it? Uh, yes, the Con Kotlin conference app. Is that it? So this thing is admittedly a little bit older, um, but uh, if you go to um, this repository is JetBrain slash Kotlin conf dash app. Uh, this is a multi-platform application in Kotlin. So it's got uh, an Android application and an iOS application. Now, the front end is written in Swift and uh, I think there's actually 
Um, it's going to be a little better than that, hopefully. You're, you're going to actually be able to write the front end in Kotlin, I believe, um, which will eventually compile down to uh, whatever appropriate lower level language iOS uses. Uh, so I think this is an older example. But uh, if you just check out Kotlin mul multi-platform programming, the idea is, so for example, with Kotlin native, um, to be able to compile to uh, C slash C++ and then also iOS. So here we go, uh, Kotlin native target platforms, iOS, Mac OS, Android, uh, yeah, all this crap. And then we have Kotlin for JavaScript, which is kind of targeting the uh, JavaScript. Now, um, I'm still not sure whether... So here's the thing. Um, I'm going to be trying to build applications where the at least the domain layer and the probably the back end generally are written in Kotlin. But if it if it's annoying and it causes errors for me to actually write the um, front end in Kotlin native uh, versus maybe using Flutter or React native, I'm not afraid to actually just use Flutter or React native. Now I. I don't have the experience with that yet, so I'll need to, I'm not settled on that judgment, but to, to, to briefly answer your question, um, that's basically where Kotlin is heading, and I'm really excited about that. So. Anyways, um, let's let's see. Uh, got a question from Jamie. All right. So uh, let me just run a quick commercial break and drink some coffee, and then I'll get to this question. Anyways, hopefully that's uh, it's been an insightful episode so far. Every now and again, I, I, I stop and take a moment to think about the fact that I'm literally like standing in a recording studio talking to a, a webcam and drinking coffee, and apparently that is of utility to the people listening to this, or at least some of them, and uh, it's quite surprising. It, I, I never thought I would be here. <laughs> I wanted to be a police officer when I was a kid. Anyways, actually, before that, I wanted to be a quantum physicist, but uh, that fell through. Okay, so um, anyways, forgive my off-the-cuff rambling. Okay, Jamie asks, do you believe a repository should not do more than basic CRUD operations? I've been tempted to allow repos to shape data and return specific data as long as no business logic leaks in. So uh, so I know uh, Jamie's a more advanced developer, so for the beginners listening to this, unfortunately I'm, I'm gonna give a less beginner-oriented answer. Um, so this one's a little bit more for those who are uh, a bit more advanced with software architecture. So um, this reminds me of an interesting debate, which, uh, so, uh, my programmers, which I, I'm sure you're familiar with, Jamie, uh, Devor and uh, Darrell, um, we have in the past had quite a lot of discussion and, and debates on um, whether you really need use cases in the context of a clean architecture. And, uh, it, and I, I think we've all kind of changed our minds repeatedly on this. And part of the issue is it really depends on how you define repository or define use case. So it appears to be the case that there are situations where you can basically treat the repository as like an interactor or a use case in the context of a clean architecture and kind of just get rid of the whole concept of the uh, use case. 
it, especially when we're in a situation where the use case is just calling some repository function and that's all the use case does. So what I would be inclined to say um, I would be in, inclined to, I'm not sure if this is so useful of an answer, Jamie, but I would be inclined to say that um, outwardly speaking, um, Outwardly speaking, if your repository does more than basic CRUD operations and you're calling it a repository, that could lead to a little bit of confusion. Um, with that being said, what is the repository pattern ultimately? It is the repository pattern is a facade pattern. I understand it's a more, for the, those who are saying, oh, it's, it's actually a more specific thing, but if you if you drop the names and you just look at what it actually looks like, it's a, it's a facade. And if we call it a facade, then we're not limiting ourselves to basic CRUD operations. And my answer would be, I think it's totally fine if um, if your repository does more than basic CRUD operations, I'm I'm trying to th let me try and let me think about this in specific examples before I just go rambling too much. Um, Jamie, I, I'd be inclined to say um, if you are. If you, you're not leaking business logic in to the repository, I don't think it really matters that much. Um, I'm just trying to think of what other, other than CRUD operations, what would you be doing? So you would have um, mapping logic. I do have mapping logic. Let me, let me let's get to a, a bit, uh, some code here. Um, so to show you what I do, instead of trying to say what is correct or incorrect, let me, I'll show you some of the things that you'll commonly see in the uh, repositories I build. Okay, so we have our iReminder repository, so we've got the external interface, and it does basically perform CRUD operations. That, that's all it really does there. Uh, when I go to the class which implements this, which is Reminder Database, I think, um, you are going to see uh, functions like to reminder. Now, because we're in Kotlin, this is actually an extension function. So, um, come on, Brain, you can do this. Uh, data extensions, is that what that file is called? Yes. So, these are essentially, these are like mapping functions. So, I'm transforming the data in the um, class which implements the repository, the, the implementation of the repository. And this is actually necessary for me to do in this class. And the reason why is that this repository works on, um, uh, hopefully I can find that. Oh, I didn't, yeah. Um, Th this repository works on, since I'm using Realm, a particular database, uh, this repository works with special um, data models, special entities. Now, because I have a, a domain layer which may not have Realm in it, it may not know that Realm is the specific API that's being used, I actually have to let me clear these out a little bit. Uh, in the, this backend database class, I have to map to the domain model. So the domain model is just called reminder from my realm reminder object. The, the, uh, 
API specific one. So I'm not sure if that's exactly what you were talking about, but I definitely do that stuff in the class which implements the repository pattern. Um, outwardly, I don't typically have uh, my repositories do anything other than basic CRUD operations, but like I said before, um, I have seen essentially uh, approaches to clean architecture where you just drop the entire idea of um, use cases in general and you essentially just have this repository. Now, uh, I'm not sure... I haven't really done that, so I, you know, I think I'm going to end that here. And the the good thing is that Jamie, I know you're smart enough. The if there was anything useful in that rambling, you'll uh, you'll pick up on it. But uh, yeah, um, that's pretty much how I look at <laughs> limitations. On uh, let me just reread the question. Do you believe a repository should not do more than basic CRUD operations? Generally speaking, when I write these things, in terms of the out, outward interface, the interface itself, it is basic, basic CRUD operations. And that's typically how I like to use the repository pattern. Um, as far as what kind of goes on inside that object, um, I, if I need to, I will do things like map to and from different kinds of data models and things like that. And that's kind of one of the nice things about Kotlin is the extension functions. So, yeah, hopefully that was useful. All right, so um, we're at the hour mark, so I'm only going to stick around for a little bit longer. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions? Well, certainly not the uh, worst live stream. I'm exhausted, though. Yeah, just reading a, a, as a follow-up, Jamie mentions, uh, he asked because uh, uh, repository, repositories is in the pattern protect against a database migration, so we need to define our own shape of the data to do so. Uh, JSON to SQL is going to be hard if there is not a set data shape. Yeah, I, I find, um, I, I really like having a domain model like a, a platform independent domain model for, for that kind of purpose. Um, that's, it, it's, it's funny, uh, um, the, the more I apply clean architecture, the more benefit seems to come from having a, some, whether you call it a domain layer or however you want to do it and whether you do it multi-module, um, a lot of benefit comes from having those just plain platform uh, library independent models and then basically having uh, I th one word for those is proxies I in the back end um, and dealing with them like that. Uh, now the what happens is you, you have to write all that mapping logic which can be pretty tedious to write like uh, let me uh, let me show everyone really quickly uh, the mapping logic that I had to write for Space Notes application. So for Space Notes, um, so if I go to the data layer and I go to, uh, let's see here, source, main, Java, um, you're, there's going to be a file called data extensions. And so um, I got to show you this. So, again, from the domain, I have um, a note uh, data model, domain model. So plain, plain old Kotlin object. 
and a note transaction and a user and this transaction type thing. I, I think that's just like a sealed class or something. And then in this application, I use room uh, and Firebase, and I have multiple room databases. So I have I have this giant um, class here, or not class, just file full of uh, extension properties and functions to map from all of these different things like note to anonymous room note, anonymous room note to note, and it just keeps going. <laughs> So, and then from mapping from different kinds of lists to another kind of list, like anonymous room note to note list and all this kind of thing. And uh, I'm, I mean, if I had to write that in Java, I would be pissed. <laughs> so anyways, I just wanted to mention that. I got a freaking love Kotlin. To, to anyone uh, working with this, it's totally, it's totally cool if you are learning Java. But uh, eventually, if you don't move to something else, I strongly suggest Kotlin. It, it's just, it's a pleasure to write things which were really annoying in, in Java. Okay, so I will stick around for another minute, wait for a final question, and if there is no final question, then we will call it a day. But yeah, um, hopefully that was uh, interesting. By the way, I will be hopefully, uh, my goal is to republish the, um, let me do a little bit of infomercial stuff. Uh, so uh, the application I've been working on is called POS Trainer. And what it does is it basically provides uh, reminders. So if you're sitting at your desk all day, then you can create and set different notifications. So here I'm creating one called Lunch Break. Uh, which will happen at 12 a.m. apparently, because that's when my lunch break is. You can change that. Um, and then you can turn a notification on, so it'll just be a reminder for you to sit up straight or do some exercises and stuff like that. Um, and then it has uh, basically a whole bunch of information on different movements, which are stretches or exercises you can perform uh, in order to fix your po posture. So these exercises are things that I do on a daily basis in order to improve my posture. Because like after an extensive day of coding, so most days, by the end of it, I, I'm, I'm like this. And so it's basically a list of exercises I do in order to be more like that. Because it's really important, especially if you're exercising, to have good posture. So the... Um, uh, application has instructional uh, high resolution images on various exercises you can perform. Now it's going to lag. And then we have like uh, detailed information on uh, how to. I need to fix this collapsing toolbar a little bit. It's kind of herky jerky. But uh, yeah, all kinds of information like how many sets to perform a week and repetitions and a description of the exercise and all th kinds of things like that. So uh, uh, thank you, Eduardo. It, uh, it's not published yet, but uh, yeah, the name is POS Trainer. And it is actually the open source application I, I posted. At, if you look up to the top of the chat, maybe for some of you, you will see Bracket Cove. Uh, you will see this repository here. Let me just show you bracket cove slash post trainer. The application is open source. However, in this open source version, uh, you're not going to get all of the uh, assets. Um, I don't have all the pictures in it so because that's kind of my own personal property, so to speak. But you will find uh, one particular instructional exercise, which is called the Gopnik Squat. So... <laughs> that's that's kind of a joke. That's yeah. But anyways, uh, as far as like a learning resource, it might be a fun application for a lot of you because uh, I've managed to. In the back end, we have, um, particularly for like reminders, I've got a, rem a broadcast receiver, a service notification manager, and an API a reminder API which works with Alarm Manager. 
Uh, there's all kinds of different databases. We've got movement database. Uh, we have some JSON parsing action, um, all kinds of fun stuff. I, I went with Realm instead of Room in this case, uh, which I'm so far pretty happy about, but uh, Room is also a great option. And uh, you're gonna see just a real, what I would call a, a clean reactive architecture. Everyone was mentioning earlier that these photos are broken. Yes, I will fix those eventually. Uh, th those were from the old user interface, so I don't actually um, uh, want to use them. So anyways, uh, uh, Eduardo, you asked about um, thoughts on Jetpack Compose. And uh, the reason why I haven't as answered your question is I've, that's the first time I've heard about it. But we have, uh, okay, a declarative toolkit for UI building. Um, huh. Let's see. Yeah, I'll have to look at it uh, for a little while. Um, I'm just, what exactly does it do? Is it just basically a replacement for find view by ID? Seems to be a lot more complicated than that. That's so descriptive. Jetpack Compose is a suite of libraries within the Android X ecosystem. Well, yeah, I, I was able to presume that, but what does it actually do? <laughs> uh, oh, okay, so no more X, XML. Okay, I see. Composable functions instead of XML layouts to define UI components. Okay. Um, Interesting. I'll I'll have to I'll have a look at it. Um, my first question would be, uh, how does it work at design time? Like, can you actually preview what you're doing? Um, it says declarative, so you should be able to. Huh. Yeah, well, I'll I'll have to have a look at it. Uh, I'm I'm a little wary of it, but yeah, we'll see. Anyways, uh, I think that's enough rambling for today. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Much appreciated. And uh, yeah, um, so once my application is finally published, then I'll be able to get back to making more video content. Uh, I have not been able to produce many videos lately whatsoever other than just doing the odd live stream. But uh, the benefit of that is um, I'm better at coding, so I'll be able to make better educational content. So uh, it's something I have to do from time to time is take a break from being a content creator and focus more on coding because let me tell you, it is really difficult to learn and like study programming and build applications at a reasonably high level and also regularly make educational content. So anyways, thanks for watching everybody and uh, I will see you next week for another live stream Q&A. Peace out.